Pre-chain reaction is out of control. Half of North America just lost their Facebook. Wait for us. This was not a made-up story. This is as real as it can get. The Earth's biggest pollution problem is not on the Earth. It's outside the planet. It's in the space. In 1957, we, the humans, sent out the first satellite in the space that kicked off the space race. The actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. One of the great scientific feats of the age. Some three minutes later, Explorer is in orbit, broadcasting to the world its coded scientific data. This close-up of the United States edition of Sputnik was made... And since then, we haven't looked back. Today, we have more than 6,000 satellites orbiting the Earth, but more than half of them are dead. Yep, more than half of them are not functional anymore. And out of the active ones, more than half are the ones that are commercial. And with the space industry booming, we're sending more and more and more stuff into the space, more than ever before. It's becoming the part of a billionaire's race to space project. But we're also increasing the chances of catastrophic in-orbital collisions. Right now, we have more than 130 million debris pieces hurling around at insane speeds, 15x faster than the speed of a bullet. But it's not just the big stuff that's a problem. Millions of tiny fragments just poses as much of a risk. Think about it, your GPS, your weather forecast, your internet, your ATM service, all at a risk of going down with just one collision. This is the number of trackable objects out there in the space that put forward by NASA in February of 2023. And that graph have multiple spikes, potentially caused by two of the most notorious events that happen in the space. This spike was caused when a defunct Russian satellite collided with a communication satellite from the US and the debris was spread around in thousands and thousands of pieces. And this one is one of the major spikes that was caused in 2009 when China conducted anti-satellite missile tests. This graph would have looked something similar to this had we not had these two major incidents. But that does not mean we can blame anyone, any country, or any company. I sat down with Dr. Muri Baja, who is the co-founder of Privateer Space, along with Steve Wozniak and Alex Fielding, to talk about this problem at depth. Every single thing that we launch into space is like a single-use plastic. It's a single-use satellite system. And when things die on orbit, they stay on orbit for many, many years. Decades, centuries, or longer, depending on the altitude. So it's almost like, you know, we, we drink something out of a plastic bottle, we just dump it on the ground, and we just take another plastic bottle and keep on dumping out of the ground. Eventually, the ground is just full with plastic bottles and we can't live our lives. So space is becoming that way. And this then becomes a hazard to satellites that are providing services and capabilities that we depend upon. But the bigger question that I want to ask is why I should care about this problem, why you should care about this problem. It's not like I or you are sending something up in the space every day. It's not like you and I are running SpaceX. When I first come across the term space junk, that was way back in 2019. In the last three to four years, there has been tons and tons and tons of coverage around that topic. In the next few years, we're going to send so many objects that none of the humankind has ever sent before. The vast majority of human-made objects surrounding the Earth are here. This is called the Low Earth Orbit, or LEO, in the space from 160 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers from the Earth. This is where we have our satellites, our telescopes, international space stations, and loads and loads of junk. The more objects we're putting in the space, the more chances of debris are there. It's a simple math. 6,000 plus objects and 130 million pieces of debris. That means a handful of these crashing incidents will increase the debris count exponentially. As somebody who uh, calls himself a celestial steward, I believe in the interconnectedness amongst all things. I believe that uh, we have a responsibility to be caretakers of the environment because we're part of the environment and it's to our detriment if we don't. And orbital space is a finite resource. It's not infinite. Um, and so we, we have to take care of it just like a finite resource. And so part of the ethos of Privateer is to uh, find ways and mechanisms to enable a circular space economy that would 
prioritize reuse and recyclability of space systems and try to make space safer, more secure, and more sustainable. As far as like how to track the stuff, we use radars and telescopes. And when I say we, I mean humanity. But the important part is we cannot pretend like this is the first time we're hearing about this problem, right? In 1970s, a study was put together by Donald Kessler and the term debris belt was first introduced. The theory, which is now known as Kessler syndrome, warned that if enough of these incidents happened, the fragments of debris they created would trigger an uncontrollable number of catastrophic collisions, exponentially increasing the depth of debris belt. To track all of this, Privateer has developed the Wayfinder. And these are the ones that are actually moving and is tracking them in real time. And these tiny little darts get so big, so big that it eventually looks something like this. This is the worrying part, actually. Now, all of these are the inactive satellites. These are the satellites that are dead for whatever reason. The mission is completed, whatever, but they're dead now. These are all uncategorized parts, like massive, massive debris. So all of these new darts are the rocket bodies. All of these are the ones that we humans are putting out in the space. Here, my friend, is the debris, the one that they have managed to track. Like, let me show you this thing. And, and you see how these are traveling? These are actually traveling. These debris pieces are not just, just staying up there in a limbo. They're floating around, floating in the orbit, and just causing a direct collision anytime. How difficult it is already in our space and it's not looking any good so this is what our current space today looks like that's the sun by the way that yellow thing where did that go there you go so that's the sun now you can actually see the potential conjunctions in the space and now here's the thing so you can click on any any of these zoom to conjunction point it's going to reset every single thing and it will take a minute to load and there we go now that's massive so you can see two satellites you can see their orbits these could collide together and this is a potential conjunction point so you can do the same thing with like over and over again so the entire space junk and debris pieces are classified in three categories pieces that are less than one centimeter big pieces that are between one to ten centimeters and pieces that are bigger than 10 centimeters the so pieces that are less than one centimeter big they're approximately 130 million in count the pieces that are one to ten centimeters big they're approximately one million in count and the pieces that are bigger than 10 centimeters, there are more than 36,000, and the ones that are easily trackable. Private here is using the data to analyze our space. Think of it like a Google map for space. So the next time you're about to put a rocket in the space, you know all of the necessary information to avoid any catastrophic damage. In order to solve our space problem, we need to think beyond just the private sector or beyond just the government sector. It's not a one person's job, it's not a one company's job, and it's certainly not a one country's job. So what exactly is the solution to all of this? Governments, based on international treaties and conventions, are liable for any damage uh, to things on orbit and to the ground from things launched into space. So governments are the ones that need to create the marketplace. And I think that uh, one of the things that's missing are sustainability metrics, because there's no rhyme or reason why you would remove one object versus another in the absence of these metrics. And so something like a carbon footprint analog, which I would call a space traffic footprint that would quantify the burden that any object poses on the safety and sustainability of anything else, as well as the idea of uh, orbital carrying capacity that quantifies the level to which uh, no matter what it is that you try to do, you have undesirable outcomes in your ability to operate or get services and capabilities from orbital space. So I think if those two things existed and governments got behind that, then um, you could quantify the, 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 the burden, economic and other, uh, to the environment of any given object, and then it would make sense to, you know, clean the thing up. The space that is called our second home hosts thousands of satellites. More than half of them are commercial from players like SpaceX, Planet Labs, and more. Here's a quick distribution of active satellites operator in the space. SpaceX is a dominating force in the industry, followed by Planet Labs, and then followed by Chinese and US governments. To clean up our space, it's going to take a lot of efforts from governments and private sectors. Today, there are few startups and government agencies who are trying to solve this problem actively. What we thought is an infinite space is suddenly becoming more and more finite, or at least the ways to get there are becoming finite. Here are four big solutions that are being put forward. So the first one is a claw capture system, 
which is developed by a Swiss startup that's called ClearSpace. The ClearSpace One will be a rocket-powered spacecraft with these arms to capture bigger than 10 centimeters particle and then will shoot them down into the Earth's atmosphere. The second one is by Astroscale, which is a Japanese startup that's developing a tugboat debris capture system. After matching the orbiting trajectory of the debris, this will either magnetically dock or will push it down into Earth's atmosphere. The third one is actually called Harpoon and a net that's being developed by Airbus. They can cast the net to capture the debris or fire this harpoon to penetrate the dead satellite and then fire them down into the Earth's atmosphere. And the last one, which, is, which seems like the most feasible one, is called laser probing. Companies like EOS, SkyPerfect, Xfusion, NASA's Project Orion are working on developing these ground-based laser deployment system. These lasers can disturb the trajectory of an incoming debris, protecting the satellite, or can nudge the debris out of the orbit. But we have yet to see any of these solutions out there and operating in the space. ClearSpace One seems like the closest to get there in reality, with a ClearSpace One scheduled to launch sometime in 2025. I believe the space economy will continue to grow as part of our efforts to colonize the space and few billionaires' effort to commercialize it. But there is one constant here. The space belongs to humanity, and we must share the responsibility for cleaning it up. I'll talk to you soon in the next one. Peace.